We're here to talk or to hear a talk by Aaron Aldrich about networking and of course all how to get the, the, the bits through and get the bits flowing, which is always the problem really. So give a big hand to Aaron. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm Aaron. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I had this, this thought with, with networking, we've like, like everything else, we've layered abstractions on abstractions on abstractions, and now you can like light up an app from a GitHub repo on a service somewhere without having any idea how anything gets to it from the internet. And uh, I wanted to dive back into like the grit of how bits flow through uh, the web, because I think understanding like why things are the way they are will help us untangle those moments where you like kind of make a bunch of arbitrary choices and then a year later find it in production. You're like, oh no, oh, no, this is bad. Like, how do I undo this? Um, so yeah, I'm going to go through all of that. And um, I wanted to start first a little bit of uh, interaction with a very classic like interview question. I think everyone's probably had this question at some point during some tech interview, maybe not. Uh, but what happens when you visit a website? Uh, and I'd love, does anyone have like a good, a good answer, a quick answer? Audience participation time, I know. It's like right before lunch, everyone's trying to. Right, right, right. Uh, but, but you know what they're asking for, right? Like everyone types in, you put a URL in the, the uh, address bar, and like what's the first thing that happens when it, it goes in? Everyone will say DNS. Um, but like, why DNS? Why do we even have this thing? Why can't we just go to a name on a website? It's like, well, because eventually, all of these bits ultimately come down to the point where there's like some piece of silicon needs to send some amount of impulses over electricity or light to another piece of silicon that has to answer it. And like, if we had to figure out how to turn names into bits all the time, that's not really sustainable. Um, so at some point, we have to figure out what those names are. But this doesn't really answer the question if you get back even further, how do you know where the DNS server is? How do we get there? How does all of that work before you even get to DNS and name translation? Um, so I thought this was interesting. Like, I was trying to figure out like, what it, how much traffic is on the internet? Uh, and this is roughly the amount of internet traffic per second as of whatever uh, internetlivestats.com believes it is, um, which is a lot of gigabytes. Uh, and also, we don't really measure like, ones and zeros in bytes. So, I mean, we do, but like we've aggregated it up so much, this number like looks less impressive. Like 167 terabyte hard drives, that's a conceivable thing to me. Um, but 1.3 quadrillion bits is like in the realm of absurd, right? And, like this is like what's actually happening. This many ones and zeros being sent every second across the internet all the time, uh, which is a lot. And they, most of them seem to get where they're going and then back and give us useful information, which is remarkable. Uh, ooh, that's uh, not enough contrast on the screen. So this was one of those old like maps of the internet thing to point out like we're not just dealing with like point to point. You're not just sending data along a web of interconnected systems. That even this I think shows individual connections and doesn't really belie the fact we've got like meshes and multiple redundancies and like all these other interconnections that those pieces of, of ones and zeros have to figure out how to get to the other side without getting screwed up and like make sure they're all in the right order. Um, how many people are familiar with like the seven layer OSI model? Like I think this is pretty common. Uh, it's also like not a thing we've really used since TCP existed uh, because there's a TCP IP model which really just squashes a bunch of things because was kind of an arbitrary separation anyway. All the top three are largely things that happen in software, and everything below that is stuff that happens in IP protocols. Um, transport being like the TCP stuff and your sessions there, uh, and then dealing with IP addresses, and then data link or network access is like, how do we start translating this into the physical world of wires and electricity? Uh, and like physical largely, you don't have any control over if you're dealing with like corporate stuff anyway, but that's you know, your actual links. Um, so why, why do we have these? Like, why visualize this stuff? And this is all because of how we actually encapsulate data when we send it over the internet. Like, we have this chunk of data, but we have to wrap it around an app header so it knows where it's supposed to go once it gets to your computer. That's got to be wrapped around TCP so it knows which port and how to get there and make sure, 
you know, we're communicating back and forth. That then has to be wrapped around IP so it even knows which system it's supposed to go to remotely. And that has to get wrapped around uh, your, what does it say here, Ethernet header, right? So for your MAC addresses so it knows where locally to even send this. All of this has to keep getting layered on top. Um, and this is why things like jumbo frames and IPv6 are interesting because it starts reducing the amount of overhead that we have. The more virtualization and layers we put on this, this has to keep getting repeated inside that data space, and you get less and less room to send information every time you send data over the internet. So the fewer abstractions we can have, the faster we can send data. Or we can send more of it at once, which is kind of the same thing. Um, and, and right, like the point I'm, I, I wanted to point here, so like this is data frames, your network access layer, MAC addresses, is how we start translating like I know I've got all this digital information, but how do I physically get it where I need it to be? Um, and this takes up a certain amount of space, right? You can see it's got some headers, knows where it's coming from, where it wants to be, uh, and it's got some error checking on the back end, because again, ones and zeros. Did I get them in the right order? Let's run a checksum and find out, or cyclical redundancy check, I think, is ultimately what it does. Um, right, people are pretty familiar with the MAC address, right? We've got six bytes of hexadecimal code, usually. Often those first three are like assigned to a manufacturer and the last three are like a device. Uh, at one point it was true, at one point it was true that that was burned in and permanent for things, but now like my phone spoofs its MAC address every time it connects to a new Wi-Fi network, so like uh, they're largely made up things, but they talk to the, they identify the, the, the network device in some way, right? They're like an identifier for like this is the port or the destination I want to send my information to. Um, this is all for same network stuff, so you're not going to see MAC addresses that are like at a remote network when it's wrapped around the packet because it doesn't understand what that means. Um, did I have notes here that I can't read? Possibly. Uh, right, so how do you figure out where to send it, right? Like, so you've got this, you want to talk to your DNS server. How do you figure out where to send that packet of information? Uh, so ARP is the, uh, the beginning thing, so this is the address. I wrote it down, but I've forgotten what it was. I probably wrote it down again. Um, doesn't matter. It's ARP. We remember what it is. Oh, thanks. Um, so this is starting to connect those bits, right? We want to translate the physical layer or the, an IP address into the physical layer. If you're connecting to something on your local network, your DNS server, if you're running that locally, for instance. Uh, like, I run a pie hole, so it's on my local network. Uh, it has to say, like, where is this? It's going to broadcast out through your network to every system there and say, hey, who's got this IP address? And eventually the other system will say, oh, that's me. Here's my MAC address. And then it can correctly encapsulate the, pixel, the packet and send it directly as a unicast instead of across your whole network, um, which is an important thing to know. Like, this is a broadcast. That's an expensive network transaction every time you're sending to every single device on the network and asking where it is. Uh, that's why your systems will have a table and cache this information so it doesn't have to do it every time. Um, but that's a thing that happens on your local network every time you're trying to find stuff. Uh, this is important to understand where we were dealing with more physical connections, but if you had redundant switch connections and didn't have spanning tree was the protocol, but it's probably too much for this talk, some way to be like, hey, don't keep broadcasting over and over again. If you send to every device on the network and that goes to another switch that sends to every port on that, which includes a link back to the first switch, which sends to every port on that, which includes a link back, uh, you've just crashed your entire network by asking for where someone lives. Uh, yeah, that was fun. Those were always fun to hunt down when someone was like, <laughs> I'm going to plug this dumb switch in under my desk. Oh, I've got this extra cord. Let me just plug it back into itself. That's probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so we want to separate some of this traffic, right? Because these broadcasts can take over this whole network, how can we limit, like, the damage? And this is where VLANs would come in, or virtual LANs, virtual local area networks. This is how you can subdivide a physical switch. Like, because before, before switching, we had hubs, which was just, like, repeat everything to everybody, which was no good. Uh, and then we could start sending to individual places. But now, like, I don't want to have to buy a new switch every time I want to be like, well, my server shouldn't be in the same broadcast domain as all my users, and, like, this other thing in the, the DMZ should probably also be a separate damage control, but I don't need like 12 individual switches to all handle this with a bunch of empty ports, so we can divide them by VLANs to limit our broadcast domains. Uh, this is like the protocol, if you care to look it up, of like what actually handles this. There used to be a Cisco way to do things, because of course there was, um, but everyone uses this one. Uh, and that has 
up to 4096 VLANs because that's just how many bits you have to identify them. There's just no more space after that. Um, like everything, we've abstracted and like blown up the layers anyway, and there's VXLAN, which operates, I think, on layer three and gives us like tens of thousands of VLANs. They work the same way, largely, but like with different underlying technology that virtualizes all of it. But it's the same idea of like, these systems are local to each other, these other ones are not. Uh, you can have native stuff, so like if you just plug in a switch, it's all running on like VLAN one. Um, but you can start tagging stuff, so that's how you can send multiple bits of traffic over the same physical port. You can send a bunch of VLANs there and do uplinks. Uh, for stuff that we work on with Equinix and providing access to like layer two networking of your physical machines in the cloud, you can start doing really interesting things, building routers out of that, sending network traffic all over to different systems, um, and like really customizing where your data goes. Uh, and this is just kind of showing it, right? Like it splits up. You can do all different things. Like there was one test here dealing with a bunch of VM stuff. We have separate public from private and vSAN networks. Um, yeah, just neat ways to divide up your network. Um, so at some point, right, that was all wrapped around to find the local place, but then we've got like this IP section that goes on too. Uh, and this all has uh, lots more information telling it like what version of IP it is, the source address, destinations, all these other bits of information. Um, but again, all of this, like the illustration here is to show that all of this takes up space in your data frame that you're sending. Like you only have so many bytes you can send and a bunch of them are dedicated just to telling it where it's going. Uh, so folks are probably familiar with like the class ABC conversation with IP addresses. Uh, that also hasn't really been used since like the 80s. Um, because it ran into this problem of uh, if you wanted public IP addresses, you could get a class C set of addresses, which was 256. If you had an, like 300 servers, you could get 65,000 IP addresses and no less. Uh, and if you like really needed a bunch, uh, your next option was 16.7 million. Is that the correct binary math, I think? Uh, so like that's kind of a problem, <laughs> both from a handing out IP addresses willy-nilly all over the world, uh, and like a routing problem. Like that's a lot of IP addresses to have to keep track of locally and route to. Um, so this is where like CIDR comes from. Whenever you're like typing in a CIDR address, you're like, why are all these slashes for subnet masks? Because we decided to subdivide it a different way. Uh, so it could be relatively arbitrary, but still be able to communicate this thing is near to me or this thing is far to me. Um, yeah, okay, I said that. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's the main point of IP addressing is largely to say, hey, is this device someone here, or is it somewhere far away? Uh, so it knows whether to go back to that MAC address level and say, hey, is your broadcast to everyone locally? It's a local IP address. Are you nearby? What's your MAC address? Or does it say, I need to go out to a router and do something else? Like, I don't know where this is. Someone else handle it. Um, it's like, we're all familiar with this. Does it, like, we know what it looks like. <laughs> It translates to the, 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 the net, one part of it is the IP address, and then you've got how many pieces of that are the network, and how many pieces are the host. Like, this is what it's dividing up. Um, so that, like, 10, 10, 10 slash 24, this is what it translates to when you're typing in your IP address and subnet mask. Um, because that 24 refers to all of those ones that just get shoved at the front of the mask. It's always broken down into binary, and it's always ones starting from the far left. So if you had a slash one, it would be one, zero, 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 zero. And there's no other way to do it. Um, so what this does is tell the computer, because it's all going to, again, it has to get back to bits. If the network address matches mine, that's local. Go send a broadcast and figure out where it is. If it doesn't, now I need to go send to a router. Um, there's some special things. Uh, so like a lot of times you'll find you can't use this IP address for a machine. That's because something that's all ones in the host is considered broadcast that'll send to absolutely everybody inside of your local network. Um, yeah, host bits all ones. And then there's the network address, which is the host bits all zeros. That's used for identification for routers, so you also cannot use it for your local machines. Asterisk. Um, <laughs> we'll come back to it. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so you've got the, the notated the network broadcast, and that gives you available hosts from 1 to 254. Um, and then this is largely arbitrary. So as an example of like subdividing that space in a weird way, you could have a 22-bit mask, which gives you like a whole, I, 
I'm not going to do the math on how many that is, but it gives you a whole bunch more uh, where you see your network is now 0, 0, your broadcast is 3.255, so I guess whatever like 256 is times 3. A, a thousand-ish addresses. Um, yeah, and so you get many more available hosts. So this, that CIDR notation is all about giving you local hosts versus remote ones. So for instance, this is really useful if you want to build a massive cluster with lots of different nodes, like you're going to want If you're, for instance, building a peer network between two routers that you don't really want anyone else communicating over, you probably just want two. Um, so uh, yeah, so speaking of wanting two, here are the weird ones. Remember I said you couldn't assign the first and last one. Turns out you can sometimes, uh, because we were running out of IP addresses, as we have been since IP addresses. Um, so originally, do I break them down? Yes, OK. So a slash 30 gives you four IP addresses, but only two of them are usable as hosts. This is the classic way it used to have to be done to have two different devices. But you lose broad which is silly because there's only one other device on the network. And you lose one to network, which is also silly because there's only two devices on the network and no one else needs to figure it out. Um, so it may be used for compatibility reasons or because you really like using FIP addresses. Um, but other than that, these other two options are like the exceptions to the rules of, of what you can use that are much better. Uh, so 31 gives you two adjacent IP addresses, right? So it's all ones with a last bit of zeros. So there's only two IP addresses per block. Um, but in this case, there's no broadcaster network address involved. They can both be hosts, and they can communicate to each other directly um, in 2000 to combat the dwindling IP. So for, for the past two decades, this has been available because we're running out of IP addresses still. Um, we're, we're out, by the way. In case anyone was wondering, there aren't IP addresses available in the public anymore. You can sublease them, but someone owns all of the IP addresses, I think except for like a handful in like, uh, yeah, the US government owns like many millions of them. <laughs> I used to work for them and it was very weird when I was like, these are all public addresses? Okay. Um, yeah, and slash 32 is gonna give you a single IP address. Um, this is useful for certain things like any cast IPs. You wanna use a single IP address to point to a place and you can reassign it to interfaces. It cannot be the only IP address of a device because it can't really route anywhere. Everything is remote from it. Um, and it has nothing on its local network, so it needs some other way to communicate out. But it is useful if you need like one public IP address from a website and can point it somewhere else. Um, right, so that routing thing, right? Like how do we get packets off of our local network? We know it should go to a router. Everyone's probably familiar with like filling in their default gateway whenever they need an IP address. Um, what does that do? So, right, check network space to see if the address is local. Sends our find MAC address, wraps it, sends data frame to the switch to the destination directly. So that's if we've got a local address. Um, oh, these are my examples, right? Yeah. So my source and destination were both local, right? Because we can see the network bits are all the same. Uh, so here our source is 10 whatever, but our destination's uh, Cloudflare's DNS because it was the first IP address I thought of. Um, so now we see the address is remote. So now instead of sending to asking where that MAC address is, it's going to say, what's the MAC address of the next hop, which is usually your default gateway if it's like your personal computer, but like if you're dealing with weird infrastructure, you could have other routing things going on. Um, so it's going to say, hey, router, what's your MAC address? You handle this. Uh, and so it's going to wrap that in the MAC address of the router, but the IP address of where it wants to send it. That's how it's going to travel locally, but still get somewhere else remote. Um, and that router is then going to rewrap the packet and say, oh, here's my next upstream hop. I, I don't know where 111 is, but here's my default gateway. And it's going to do that over and over again until it gets to an adjacent router. Eventually, someone will be next to 111. It will be like, oh, and send it right along and do that. So that's how it eventually traverses. It uses that MAC addressing layer 2 to keep making a bunch of local hops, but remains with that 1111 and the IP address of saying this is ultimately where we're trying to get it. Um, so again, all of this is like overhead. Like every, this is why every additional hop takes longer, not just because you're going to a new place, but it has to analyze the packet, strip off the headers, rewrap the frame, and send it along. Also why routers have like CPUs and RAM. Uh, right, how do we know where stuff is? Routing tables. Uh, you probably also have these on all of like, your system all have these as well. It's basically saying, 
where, where IP address is this? Like, which one do I use to send it somewhere else? Um, most of your systems have a very simple routing table that's like, this is my local network connected to the Ethernet port, and this is my router. That's usually what like, your PC's routing table will look like. Um, a router, on the other hand, will have like, here's what's connected to me, here's my default route, here are the advertised routes that I've been told about, here's where other things are. It'll have all these different ideas of what's out in the internet and different ways to send traffic. Um, connected networks are one, so routers will have something that's, you've said, hey, this port is 10.10.10.0, and it goes, great, I know where that is, it's on this port. Um, static, usually the gateway, these are things where you tell it where the route is. Uh, and the last one is learned, like at some point, we can't manually enter every route for every IP address on every router um, that lives on the internet backbone, so they need to share information with each other and say, hey, I know where that is, you can send that to me if you, uh, if you need it, and they advertise it all out. So this is gonna be like advanced basic networking. <laughs> BGP is the routing protocol that runs the internet and breaks the internet. Um, but it is the only reason we can efficiently send packets across the globe is having all of these interconnected routers all advertising to each other all of these different addresses. Um, it has to be between peered connections, that's over TCP, so that means they don't have to be local to each other. You could have a BGP connection with something that's multiple hops away from your network, it's all over TCP, um, but it's directly connected to another system. They both have to agree, like, I'm gonna send it, to Jeremy, and Jeremy's like, I'm gonna send it to Aaron. We're like, yeah, cool. Um, there might be a password. I can also aggregate this to save space. Uh, old Cisco routers had a limit of like 512,000 uh, routing table entries. You'd think that wouldn't be a problem until some country accidentally leaks 30,000 new routes to the world, and then uh, it overflows all those tables. Um, so it can aggregate these up. So if you know where, say, like, I don't know. Maybe you've got like, I'm gonna use private addresses because the first one's kind of 192.168.1 and they're all 24 bit, but you know where one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, like maybe that whole space, you know the whole, even though they're different networks, you can advertise that as one address in the routing table and say, I know where all of these are. Just send all of that to me. Um, and so that saves space in the routing tables, which turns out to be a thing. There's a lot of routes out there. Uh, this also helps determine the best route, right? Because these, our systems, like I said, aren't just connected point to point. There's not just one path to get everywhere. We have multiple paths, often a mesh, lots of different choices. What is the best path to get there? Uh, without diving too deep into it, BGP lets you identify a whole bunch of criteria about what the best path is. Uh, so sometimes that's shortest, sometimes it's fastest, sometimes it's cheapest because you're an ISP and it costs you money to send over other ISPs. Uh, sometimes it's locality. Uh, we send a lot of stuff through our backhaul network internally, even though it might be like, normally you'd route out through public ISPs. Equinix is like, uh, we've got a data center near there, so we're just gonna route it along our edge network until it gets there and then send it back out publicly. Um, cheaper, we own all that infrastructure. We don't have to pay to transmit that data. Um, so yeah, lots of reasons why you would determine what is a best route. Uh, and multiple routes, can contain the same prefixes. So like multiple systems can all say like, all advertise they know where it is, even though they're all pointing to different places, which allows for some really cool stuff. Um, that last bit is what you can leverage for lots of edge performance stuff using Anycast. So you can have a, an application running all over the world, say whatever localities are most important to you all over the world. Every single one of those can be assigned the exact same IP address and advertised to BGP back to the public internet. So now when I ask to go to your site or app or whatever it is, and I get that one IP address, I'm gonna be given the best route for me. So if you've got a server in Detroit, that's probably the one I'm gonna connect to. But if someone's in Amsterdam trying to connect to it, they're gonna get the server in Amsterdam that you have lit up because that's their best path. And what's even greater is because it's all meshed, if one goes down, everything else still works. It might go slower if the one in Detroit is down and not advertising anymore, but I can still get to Amsterdam from here. So it's not broken, it's just a little bit slower. Um, yeah, BGP gets weird, right? Like, so understanding all of that is like, I thought pictures would be useful and it was hard to draw and, and do bullet points at the same time. Um, but this is kind of the idea of, you've got your network and a router with a BGP table, it's advertising somewhere to an ISP or someone who's got permission to advertise things publicly, uh, and you've got that paired, both with like, you're both agreeing on that connection, there's usually a password that's shared if it's not something you're setting up for fun. 
Um, and again, it's not that simple because they're all interconnected. And uh, you know, you've got your internal BGP running. It's got to route some of those out. Uh, there's some differences with internal and external BGP, which are kind of a bit complicated. But largely, the gist is like internal won't keep re-advertising the networks it learns also internally because you'd get routing loops. Um, and again, they're all meshed, right? So like that's the, the, the challenge here. So if we, for instance, were trying to get to this router on the south, let's say it's where we're, our destination, we're coming in from the router on the north, we don't have to route around the edges because we're already meshed to it. We can just go directly. Um, and this is the example of any cast, right? So we've got all of these autonomous systems are advertising this IP address, 8888. Uh, your computer's physically closer to this one on the left, so it's going to route to that one. If you have a computer physically close to the other one, it'll route to that one. If one of them goes down, it'll still route to one of them either way. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm going to try and get it right. <laughs> uh, autonomous systems are largely the, the determination of like, you've got a bunch of networks. Uh, and so it's not just one network, but this whole system that advertises and understands what's going on there on its own and, and runs it autonomously. Uh, so you've got an autonomous system, and there's a remote autonomous system, usually given a number. There's, I think, like 0 through 65,000 are all public, and you cannot use them. Like, you have to get those specially assigned and permission, and 65,000 and up, you can use willy-nilly. Um, and yeah, they're just ways of identifying, like, oh, hey, I'm autonomous system 5, because again, Bits, numbers are easier to work with than names. Uh, this is just, oh, this is way small for a screen. But uh, this was supposed to show, <laughs> like, similarly a ping time showing you the idea, like, it's much closer to a bunch of different places at once, even though it's using a single IP address. Uh, and so that brings us back, right? Like, what happens when you visit a website? Well, first off, a whole bunch of stuff happens before you get an answer for who is Google.com, right? You have to, like, Figure out the IP address of your DNS server. Is it local? Get a MAC address. Is it remote? Do I need to send it through a router? And that's going to all route our traffic. Maybe your DNS even benefits from, uh, I'm sure Cloudflare is using some level of, of CDN and Anycast to like put their DNS servers everywhere. So like all of this matters just to get the IP address of the website you're trying to use before you've even made that request through HTTP. Um, I think this is all relevant now because we just keep building on top of this and layering networks, right? We've got like these physical systems are all doing that, and then we put a virtual system that's running Kubernetes, that's running pods with containers that all have separate virtual networks, and all of this propagates through all of those. The same patterns all the way down, it's the same stack all the way down. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think digging into that, that grit helps us un untangle stuff. Like I had to troubleshoot an ARP problem the other day, because like, why can't I get to my gateway? Oh, because my server has no idea where that is, even though they're supposed to be connected. Um, so yeah, it's uh, all stuff. So well, thanks for listening to me. I'm Aaron, by the way. <laughs> uh, I work as a developer advocate at Equinix. Uh, I do some DevOps Days stuff and sometimes some podcast things. I'm at Craze on Twitter, C-R-A-Y-Z-E-I-G-H. I'd love to hear more feedback from this. Like, is there stuff that you wanted to know that I didn't dig into? Is there stuff that like is super obvious? Then like I'd love to be able to tweak this. There are slides at speaking.crazea.com if you like want the reference points for any of these and download them. Um, other cool stuff, if you want to play with cool networking things, we've got a $500 credit code for you. You can uh, log into Equinix and uh, have fun and play around and do some neat networking things and see what you can do. And also if you deploy a device before November 8th, it enters you in to win uh, a little Lego data infrastructure platform. I wouldn't want to call it a data center. <laughs> um, I think that's it. I was also going to put up a thing like if you wanted to work on this stuff directly, but I, I didn't get it in, in time. So you can just talk to me if that's the thing you want to do. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Big, big thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Um, that, does, let's start off. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't mind repeating. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just it's largely where the where is that replication happening? So if it's happening at DNS, you've got to have some logic of the DNS servers to give a different answer based on the locality of the requester. Um, 
and if it's BGP, it doesn't matter. It's going to give the same answer to DNS every single time, but it's going to get routed to a different place based on the actual routing tables that are propagated through BGP. So that's doing the same thing at a different point in the, in the, the route. Uh, I like the BGP way because you don't have to like maintain all these DNS records and make sure they're answering correctly. It just gives the same answer to DNS every time. You have to make sure a slightly different complicated thing is working correctly. So. Yeah, without, I, didn't, I didn't dive deeply into DNS because I, I didn't get back up to that layer. Uh, but uh, yes, right, DNS all has a, there's a level of authority with different servers and you have a time to live on your answers. So making changes can be problematic if it's DNS. If you're like, because you probably want a long TTL if you've got a live active service with lots of users. You don't want someone else to like screw up the IP address and then not be able to set it back and cause problems. Um, so like making changes to a DNS entry could take up to 24 hours depending on your... DNS settings. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Caching will be a whole thing too, and, and all that. So, yeah. So, yeah. Again, that's why I like BGP. It's a little bit lower cost to, to do and less caching and complications that get thrown in. <laughs> Differently complex. <laughs> Yeah.